Praise the Lord. Everybody over there, I said, Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for another session again because Christ Jesus, our Savior, Lord, is inexhaustible. And we come now, Lord, to listen to what you have to say, Father, about Jesus, the all sufficient Savior, all sufficient Redeemer, all sufficient Lord. And we pray you keep us awake even in the condition physical in which we are. And we pray that the knowledge of Christ will increase, will go deeper, higher, further, in every life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Confirm the truth of Christ, the worthiness of Christ, the goodness of Christ in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray another amen. amen a good amen to show you are not tired of jesus amen. god bless you you can see now once again we're coming to the scriptures we're coming to the revelation of god concerning jesus he is the just king but love and might jesus the just king, but love and might. In Zechariah chapter 9, reading from verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just. Having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt of, the, of an ass. We're talking about Jesus, and here is revealed to us as the one that trains is the reigning king, and he is just. He comes with love. He comes with might. And it comes with love for everyone to do in every life what only he, the just king, can do. Look at Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 3. It says, and they sang, the, the, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Here again, it's revealed to us the Lamb of God, the one who is just, is the one who is the King, the King of of saints it says in verse 4 who in verse 4 who shall not fear thee O Lord and glorify thy name for thou only at holy for all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments are made manifest Jesus the just, Jesus the king, Jesus the lover of your soul, Jesus the might and the power of God. Put everything together, the just king with love and might. When you looking at uh, four things here, that goes with J, K, L, and M. Number one, Jesus, the just, the sinless, spotless Savior. Number two, Jesus, the King of kings, higher than the highest sovereign. Number three, Jesus, the Lamb of God, supreme. 
sacrificing for our sins. Supreme sacrifice for sin. Number four, Jesus, the mighty God, was supernatural spirit. The supernatural strength of the spirit. Look at number one. Number one is Jesus, the just, the sinless, spotless Savior. Sinless, spotless Savior. We're told in First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, for as much as she know, if you didn't know, you ought to know. Now you know, for as much as she know, that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from, by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19, but was the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, about this same Jesus. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, in Christ, in the Savior, in the Redeemer, in a spotless one, in a sinless one, in him is no sin. We need to know what who Christ is and what Christ means for every one of us. Jesus, the just, the sinless, the spotless Savior. Look at three things here. Number one, Jesus the Savior from all sins. Number two, Jesus, the justifier of all who surrender and separate from sin. Number three, Jesus, the judge of all, all scoffers, all sinners, all saints, all servants. He is the judge. By him, all our actions are waged in the perfect balance of God. Look at number one there. Jesus, the Savior from all sin. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save. He, no other one. He is the one that has the power. And the finality of power, he shall save his people from their sins. If you are not saved from sin, you are not one of his people. If you are still diving into the ocean of sin, if you are still swimming in the sea of sin, if you are still swallowing, all the sins around you, and you are living a sinful life, you are not one of his people. You can belong to any church, any denomination, any assembly. That doesn't make you one of the people of God. What makes you a child of God? And what makes you one of his people is that you are saved. You allow him to save you from all your sins were told in John chapter 1, verse 29. And when, and the next day, John said, Jesus, that's him, that's our Savior, come in unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When you have contact with Christ, contact with Jesus, contact with the Savior, what he does in your life is that he looks at all your life, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your, your character, your behavior, everywhere. He searches everywhere and he takes sin away from you. All the sins of the world, all the sins of our neighbors, all the sins of society, 
All the sins that were made in the world and entered into us. When you meet Jesus, he takes away your sin. And you live a life free from sin while you are here in the world. In First John chapter 3, chapter 3, reading from verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Verse 6. In verse 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever, whatever his name, whosoever, whatever her name, whosoever, whatever his position, whosoever, whatever his authority, whosoever, whatever his testimony, whosoever, whatever, he may go around looking about himself, whosoever sinners has not seen him. That's why we don't uh, give unnecessary hypocritical honor to people who are sinning against Christ, who are sinning despite the sacrifice of Christ, and we don't exalt them for making a rubbish of Calvary. Christ came, and the great thing he came to do is so that he will take sin away from us and take us away from sin. And anyone, anywhere, with any position, authority, religious position, religious authority that lives in sin, in defiance of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, we don't give a pinch of salt and we don't give any iota of honor to the one who dishonors Calvary, anyone. Because whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Look at verse 7 there. In verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even he as he is righteous. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he that committeth sin. Tell me, read it from your Bible, read it out aloud, he, whoever, anywhere, he, whoever, whatever control, authority, the person may seem to have, hey, you're not going to submit to Christ and submit to the enemy of Christ at the same time. You're not going to submit to the Savior and the adamant sinner. At the same time, he says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil in your life. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Look at number two there. Number two is Jesus, the justifier of all who surrender and separate from sin. He is the justifier. Look at uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 26. In Romans chapter 3, verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, is righteousness that he might be just and the justifier. is just and he is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. If you have not tasted the justification, it's here for you today. It will justify you. It will cleanse you. It will make you a brand 
new creature that your life will be totally different higher than your life of the past look at chapter 4 Romans chapter 4 verse 5 it says in Romans chapter 4 verse 5 but to him that worketh not to him that are giving up trying laboring sweating so that he can set himself free because he knows it's an impossible job you cannot lift up yourself by the straps of the boots that you wear and you cannot take yourself to heaven by anything that you do and so you know there is no way there's no freedom there's no justification coming through that path. And wisely, you leave that path because he is the one that justifies the people who are not working for salvation, but they're believing for salvation. The believers on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted righteousness his faith is counted for righteousness we go to number three number three is the judge of all that those who scoff is the judge of the scoffers that those who scorn is the judge of the scorners that those who sin deliberately they know that God commands against this. They know this is the way of righteousness. Walk ye therein. And they say, we will not walk therein. And deliberately, they sin against the evident commandment of the Lord. Some sin by weakness. Some sin by depravity. Some sin by their will. To say, I know that's right. I know God wants that. I know Jesus died for that. But by their set will, the sin by their will. However anybody says, and he refuses to repent, he is the judge of all. The scoffers, the scorners, the sinners, the saints, and the servants. He judges all. In John chapter 5, reading from verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. The Father has delegated, the Father has committed all judgment of all people in every generation. The Father has committed all judgment unto Christ. And he is the Christ who knows all things. He knows all things about all people in every generation. And he judges according to the revealed truth of what our lives have been. We can come to him today and allow him to take away the sin. Or somebody may continue and continue adamant, rebellious, willful in sin until there is no remedy. I pray you'll be wise. I will be wise. I will not be a scoffer. I will not be a scorner. And not be an Adamite. You know that word Adamite comes from Adam. Adamite. Adamant sinner. I'll not be an Adamant sinner. 
but you'll be somebody who is absolutely surrendered unto Christ because it's in that surrender, it's in that submission, it's in that giving yourself to the only Savior that brings the salvation of the Lord to you today and then you escape the judgment of God eventually. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, K, Jesus, the King of kings, higher than the highest sovereign on earth. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, reading from chapter 5, reading from verse 8, it says, If thou seest oppression of the poor, the oppression of the poor, and violate perversion, perverting of judgment and justice in a province, any part of the world. It says, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be a higher person, personality, than the Christ, the King, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is the one higher than the highest. And you come to Him, you bend to Him, you bow to Him, you submit to Him as the King of Kings, higher than the highest sovereign. When you're looking at three things here. Number one, the king said and seated a sovereign. Number two, the king of saints, the surpassing of surpassing splendor. Number three, the king with the scepter of supremacy. Look at number one. Number one, Christ Jesus, the king said and seated as sovereign. In Psalm 2, reading from verse 6, Psalm 2, reading from verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That the Almighty, that the Most High, that's God in heaven, saying, affirming that he the Almighty has set Jesus as King upon his holy hill. Ah, Pastor Preacher. You see Jesus. I can't find Jesus there. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day, have I begotten thee? And he says of that son, I have said, my king, the son, Jesus, upon my holy hill of Zion. He is the said, seated, sovereign, king, king of kings. What are we to do? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Kiss the Son. Honor the Son. Love the Son. Bend before the Son. You see, in those days, even, here, even in our world now, this generation, it, it is a culture where when somebody gives the highest honor, he'll bend down and kiss the foot or the feet of the one that he honors. That's why it says, bend low. Bench down. Humble yourself. Come as a pleading sinner and bench before the Son of God. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled. But a little blessed are all they 
that put their trust in him. I'm believing that you are putting your trust in Christ. I said I'm believing that you are putting your trust in Christ. Savior and Lord, judge and king. Look at number two here. Number two, the king of saves in surpassing splendor. He is the king of saves in surpassing splendor. We're told in Revelation chapter 15, and I'm reading there from verse 3, the king of saves. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. The King of saints. You discover that believers are called saints in the New Testament. They are not called sinners. When they believe, they believe in Christ. The sins are blotted out. Their sins are cleansed away. Their sins are forever gone. And they are transformed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A renewed creature. A reformed creature. A renewed creature. If any man be in Christ, he is, if he's really in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. In that newness of life, the believer is called saint. And when you become a saint like that, not when you are dead, when you are still alive, he becomes your king. He is the king of saints. And he has surpassing splendor over your life, in your life, and through your life. Oh, we're looking at number three here. Number three, he is the king or the scepter of supremacy. The king or the scepter of supremacy. Hebrews chapter 1 we're looking at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 1. Reading from verse 8. But unto the Son, he says, Unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of of thy kingdom. That's talking about Christ. And then in verse 9, it says in verse 9, But uh, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. He loves righteousness. Why? Is Christ the righteous? Why? Is Christ that came to establish righteousness in the heart of his followers? Why? If the one who has been righteous from all eternity, he loves righteousness. He hates anything that contradicts that righteousness. God doesn't have favorites that he'll say, I know him. I know the life is bad. I know the life is sinful, but all the same is my favorite no, no, a thousand times, a million times, no. He loves righteousness. And it says he hates iniquity. Anywhere that is found, the one that deliberately goes into iniquity and he says, I'm the favorite of God. And so I can do whatever you will discover to your dismay. That God is no respecter of persons. And Christ loves righteousness. Anywhere, in anyone, it's found. And Jesus hates iniquity in whomsoever that is found. Therefore, God, even my God, has 
anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's our king. The king that has the scepter of righteousness. Let's go to the next point now. We're looking at El Jesus, the Lamb of God, the supreme sacrifice for sin. We're told in John, John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, stop everything and look at this one. Behold, and turn away from everything and look at this one because any other thing you look at cannot prepare you for eternity. Any other thing you look at cannot change your life and make you qualified to enter heaven. Stop everything. Turn away from everything. Disregard every other thing. Behold, the Lamb of God will take us away from the sin, the sin of the world. He'll take all your sins away. But you must look at him. You must look by faith. You must focus on him. You must behold him. Behold, the Lamb of God will take us away the sin of the world. There are three things we're considering. Number one, the Lamb for salvation for all sinners. Number two, the light shining beyond the sun, beyond the stars. Number three, the Lord over all saints and over all subjects. All citizens. Look at number one. Number one, the Lamb for salvation for all sinners. The Lamb for salvation for all sinners. It tells us sin. Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book. The four beasts, living creatures, and the four and twenty elders representing the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles of the New Testament representing the old and the new twenty-four. And the twenty-four elders, they fell down before the Lamb, having Every one of them harps and golden veils full of the odors which are the prayers of the saints. What are they saying? Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and the song, a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, the book. Of the redemption of the whole earth. And to open the seals thereof. For thou was slain and hast redeemed us unto God. By thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's our savior. That's the king. That the Lamb and the salvation he has, he has given, is for everyone out of every kindred, every tongue, every language, and people, every community, tribe of people, and every nation. Look at number two. Number two is the light shining beyond the sun and the stars. The sun. Shining, the stars shining, and he is above them all. The shining light. Look at John chapter 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. It says, When then speak he. 
Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world the light of the sun can give you some physical light to see around you of the moon of the stars but all those sources of light only give you light here on earth here is the one that goes beyond them shines beyond them and here is the one that takes you beyond the sun beyond the stars here jesus the light of the world he says he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness he that followeth me Followeth me the light shall not walk in darkness. Any other, any other a kind of realm you are walking, if it's secret, if it's darkness, if it's something you have to cover up under the shade of the dark night, you are not of God. If you have God, you have repented. You have turned away from all the works of darkness, all the powers of darkness, all the things that show darkness, the people who have not come to the light that they do. You are not of God, but when you come to Christ and the light of Christ shines inside you, it says you follow him and you will not walk in darkness but you'll have the light of life. A good amen there. Amen. That's why he said, let your light so shine. The people around you will manifest shady deal, dark deals, and dark behavior. The people around you will live and say, uh, people must not see this, people must not know this. And as you live in the midst of those people, as you live and work in your office, anywhere you are, as you mingle around people you know and people you don't know, you want to be a shining star. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three is the Lord over all saints and over all subjects. The Lord over all saints and over all subjects. In Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 36. Acts 10, reading from verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Peace, peace with God, by Jesus Christ. Peace, peace on the inside, in your soul. No condemnation, no confusion, no damnation. And in your heart, there is peace. Peace in preaching peace, peace in your home, with your wife, with your husband, transparent, deep, true, faithful, not hypocritical, not a make-believer, not, let me keep quiet so that I don't disturb him, I don't disturb her, so there is peace, not that kind, the peace that goes beyond every hypocrisy and goes beyond every superficial covering the people have through him. Jesus will preach peace and peace with our neighbors, peace with everyone. There is no infighting, 
There's no psychological fighting. There's no diplomatic fighting. There is no uh, fighting for supremacy among the real people of God. He gives us peace. Peace with your neighbors. He gives us peace from tribe to tribe. Tribe between one tribe and the other tribe. When we know Christ, the priest of peace, he gives us peace. And he says, preaching peace, proclaiming peace, and having peace by, the, by Jesus Christ, who you see, look at that bracket, he is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of all. We we'll come to the next point here. Point number four, this is the aim. Jesus, the mighty God with supernatural strength of the Spirit. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm reading there from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. That's his name, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Of the increase of his kingdom and his peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, of the king. Upon his kingdom. It says, To order it. When it comes to your life, it takes disorderliness away. And it brings order into your life. It brings some good order. That your life is not disorderly anymore. Because he, this Christ, this Jesus, this mighty God, brings order. He says to order it. And to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth. From now, from today, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this in your life. Amen. Look at three things here. Number one, the Messiah with satisfactory sacrifice for sin. The Messiah with sacri uh, satisfactory sacrifice for sin. Number two, he is the mediator, the source of salvation for sinners. Number three, the master who served a servant to show servants the standard. Look at number one. Number one, he is a Messiah. In Daniel chapter 9, Reading from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9. We're reading from verse 24. It says, 70 years, sorry, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. To finish transgression. The Messiah. That's what he came to do. To finish transgression. To put an end to, to transgression. To make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And he says to bring everlasting righteousness. Not intermittent righteousness. Righteous on Sunday. Righteous on Monday. Righteous on the festival day. Unrighteous on the ordinary day. Righteous 
most of the days of their life, or, or the least of their lives, or righteous, most of the days of their lives. You know, those, um, you know, they are up on Sunday and down. During the week, they are up in the public and they are down in the private. No, those ones have not tasted the reason why the Messiah came. He is to put an end, make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the holy, the most holy. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, No, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until unto the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, the one that will come and put an end to sin. The one that will come and establish righteousness in every soul, every heart that believes in him. The Messiah, the Prince, shall be 70 weeks and three score and two weeks. And it says the streets shall be built again. And the wall, even in troublous times, he is the Messiah. And he is the one who has come so that all our sins are washed away. What a wonderful thing to know him. And then after we know him, our lives are no longer the same. First Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. First Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new love, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, the Messiah, even Christ, the Passover, the Messiah, is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice. Believers who have known Christ, they don't hold malice. What's malice? If the inside seated hatred the people have for what he has done against them. What's malice? If the seated hatred and emosity in the heart for what he is doing against me. What's malice? The hatred, the evil that people have in their heart for the suspicion. He may do something, he has not done it, I'm suspecting him. He may say something about me. He may do something against me. Before he does it, they have the hatred. They have the malice. And they have the seated animosity and evil planning against him for what he has done, for what he is doing now, and for what he may do against them. It says, when you have experienced the Messiah, when you have experienced Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, you lay aside everything that is of malice or wickedness. But let's keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity, of honesty, of transparency, and truth. We're coming to number two here. Number two, he is the mediator, the source of salvation for all sinners. Here is Jesus presented to us from all areas 
and all sides. He is the mediator. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. It says, but now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, more excellent than the ministry of Moses, more excellent than the ministry of Aaron, more excellent than the ministry of the old covenant priests. Now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. There's no other covenant that, uh, that's comparable with the covenant we have in God with God through Christ. And there's no other covenant will come. He has made the final covenant. He has made the fullest covenant. He has made the foremost covenant. And it's a better covenant that he has made which was based and established upon better promises. All we need, we now find in Christ. All you need, you now find in Christ. Amen. amen. You know, when you say amen, I know you have not fallen asleep because you know sometimes, you know, when you listen to uh, the voice of a preacher, it's like, you know, a good song you are listening to and just put some people to sleep, you will not sleep. Amen. Amen. Now we have this better covenant and the reality of it be fulfilled in every one of your lives in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here he is the master who served a servant to show all his servants the standard of service. The standard of service. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you. That's why we came to him. He wants to take away the old mind we had. The old mindset we have. You understand? It's what you construct in your mind that you bring out in life. It takes place in your mind first. And when you have the mind of the world, the mind of tradition, the mind of religion, the mind of, allow me, that dear mommy, when I was growing up, I used to see what my dad was doing. He wasn't born again at the time I was talking about. And there were things he did. He was a strong mind. He wasn't a soldier, but he had the mind of a soldier. Determined. And if he said, this I will do, he never forgot. I know that man. He was my father. Action, attitude, life, relationship, and he knew oh, my father was clever. He could smile and you see his teeth as he grins. But what he was going to do, he had a strong mind. That's what he would do. Yeah, there are people that still have the mind of their father. On the other hand, my mother, of blessed glory, I'm not seeing anything that will, nothing can hurt her where she is. But my mother, even the facial appearance, gentle and soft and nice and inviting. If you did anything against her, she didn't lose a smile. But because I was the firstborn, if she'll tell me. He'll say, he called me by, you know, the name is, he, he loves to call me. And he'll say, you know what? That person does not understand, but I'll show him. And true, she will show that person. And when I was growing up, I came to a crossroad. I'm going into life. And I saw the picture before me, what the Lord 
will make me to become in Christ. And I ask myself, what mind do I want to carry from here? The mind of my dad, the mind of my mom, and I decided there's a better mind, the mind of Christ. Somebody give me a good amen. And with all the love and all the respect, I have, I had and still have for dad and mom, I chose to drop the mind of dad and mom. And now to take on the mind of Christ. And you come to the crossroad. You can take the mind of that hero, the mind of that leader, the mind of that person that they can have the undercurrent of evil under the carpet. And then above the carpet, they can look as nice as any pretender can be. If that's your choice, eternity will close its door against your butt. When you drop all that mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, who? Being the form of God, sought it not to be robbery, to be equal with God. Then in verse 7, in verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. That's the problem. The people want to have reputation. They want to have human honor. And they want to kind of organize everybody, every event around them to give them that honor. And if there is an isolated man, isolated woman that says all the honor I can give, I give to Christ. In fact, I don't have enough. If I have a thousand tongues, I will sing only one song to the praise of my Redeemer. When you see somebody there who does not want to help them to maintain the high level reputation they are looking for, then they show their real mind. But all the same, we look at Christ who made himself of no reputation and he took upon him the form of a servant. He was found, he was made in the likeness of men. And then in verse 8, we're told, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. God did not humble him, he humbled himself. The events surrounding did not humble him, he humbled himself. And when we follow after the path of Christ, and we have the mind of Christ. We don't want, we don't wait for, you know, a pastor somewhere to come and humble us, humiliate us. We can do that by ourselves. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. And now that's the reason why God, the Father, has highly exalted him. And you want exaltation through exaltation, eternal exaltation, you humble yourself before the Lord. And then you come to Christ. And all the attributes of Christ, and all the goodness of Christ, all the graciousness of Christ, you'll have in your life from today in Jesus' name. I will have. I will have. Why can't I hear you? Because I will ask. Because I will ask. Because I will ask. The Lord grant you the very mind of Christ from today till you see him face to face in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer so that the resource higher make us 
what we ought to be, which we have not been. Let's talk to the Lord Jesus so that he'll give us a very heart, his very mind, his very life, his very humility, a very holiness that God, the God of heaven, where he produced Christ in everyone that calls upon him. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord.